Good morning, folks, and welcome to the IBM Kiskid Live Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to you, the research and academic quantum communities. Now, in just a minute, I'll be thrilled to roll out this week's episode with Professor David Hughes from Princeton University. And it's my absolute pleasure. I've been looking forward to this episode for quite some time. Now, before we get there, I'm so glad you joined us on time. Uh, we have a tradition to give everyone just about a minute or two to tune into the live stream. And meanwhile, to get those fingers fired up in the chat, because you guys already know my favorite question, which is, where is everyone tuning in from today? Let us know in the comment chat box located above, below, left or right, somewhere on your YouTube screen, because that is the same place that you can ask questions live of David and myself today and discuss them amongst each other. I'll politely interrupt David with questions that uh, you, myself or uh, somewhere here has. And we'd like to keep this a very lively and interactive format, almost like an in-person seminar with lots of questions. So don't hesitate. Uh, folks, I think the Kiskit Summer School videos are coming up or have come out. So take a look at those. That's a lot of great preparation for David's talk today, introducing you to quantum computing. And you know, we had 6,000 plus students this summer on the Kiskit Summer School. I got the pleasure of teaching a few lectures in quantum noise there. So take a look at those. Uh, I think that's a great resource if you're wondering where to start. And to keep you up to date, click like and subscribe. So with that, it's time to get started. I'm your host, Zlatko Minev from IBM Quantum Research. And on this episode 138, I have my an absolute pleasure to introduce you to Professor David Hughes from Princeton University. Hello, David. How are you today? Very good, thank you. Thank, uh, thank you for accepting the invitation and coming to the quantum information community, plus many enthusiasts, plus you know all kinds of folks uh, who are interested in quantum and, and many body physics and uh, science. And uh, where are you tuning in from today, David? In my office at Princeton University. Well, that's a great segue to a bio, which uh, you will allow me to introduce you with before uh, we turn it over to you, David. So, folks, um, David probably doesn't need much introduction, but in, in our tradition, David received his PhD in theoretical physics from Cornell University in 1983, supervised by Michael E. Fisher. David continued his research staff at the iconic Bell Laboratories until 1996, when uh, he became professor of physics at Princeton University. And the rest, you may say, is history, history and waves in the world of theoretical physics. David is known as a spin glass guru, a virtuoso of vortices, and a maestro of many body quantum dynamics, and is a prize member of the National Academy of Sciences and the recipients of too many honors and awards to name, including the 2022 Lars Onzager Prize. So with that, David, the stage is yours. Hello. Um, so although this is a uh, quantum information seminar series. Today's talk will be a theoretical physics talk, um, but on a topic that at least you know, some people working in the area of quantum information and quantum dynamics uh, are interested in, um, namely uh, many body localization. Um, so I've put my email there for uh, if any, any people have questions that they don't get to ask and don't don't get answered, uh, please email me. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, what what is this topic? Many body localization. Um, it's Anderson localization. And in fact, it's discussed in Anderson, Phil Anderson's original paper, uh, which is published in 1958. Um, uh, what Phil Anderson was talking about in that paper was uh, many interacting spins in a insulating semiconductor and asking the question of do those spins interacting with each other and ignoring the interactions with the phonons and other degrees of freedom in that semiconductor, does the spin bath alone constitute a bath which you know is a thermal system 
And that might explain the line widths of the spins that were seen in the resonance experiments that were being done in the 50s. So that's really was the context of the discovery of Anderson localization. It was this many body problem and it was about thermalization. Um, but very quickly, he made an approximation uh, to treat a single spin flip as if it was a particle and then make a non-interacting approximation. And that became what is, you know, what is now known as Anderson localization, which is non-interacting quantum particles. Um, but, you know, the, the first two pages of that paper are about the many body problem. Um, Okay, so many body localization in today's terminology is Anderson localization of many interacting, and I'm going to today talk about spins, because that's also, that's what we usually do in this discussion, and that's what Anderson originally did, uh, but they could be particles or other quantum degrees of freedom. Um, they are interacting, so there's many of them, and they're in a highly excited state at thermodynamic conditions such that if it went to equilibrium, uh, it would have non-zero entropy density. Um, and then often uh, for convenience, since we're talking about high temperatures and we're talking about spin systems, we can just go to infinite temperature, which means just consider all quantum states with equal probability. Um, okay, so often we study infinite temperature and that's what I'll be mostly talking about today. Um, the many body system is closed. So I've drawn this little box at the bottom. Um, so that's uh, N spins isolated from uh, any external environment and they have a Hamiltonian H which is giving their dynamics. Um, and I say no external environment because in some sense the question here is, is this system itself an internal environment which is gonna produce equilibration and decoherence or not, right? So there's no external environment. We're asking, is the system able to be an environment for itself, right? And if we're in the many body localized regime, that's where many body localized phase, that's where it fails to do that. So although the spin, although the degrees of freedom are all interacting with each other, uh, they don't produce a bath for the subsystems of, you know, the system itself is not a bath for its subsystems and it is unable to bring itself to thermal equilibrium under uh, the dynamics given by its Hamiltonian, which is unitary quantum dynamics, right? That's what many body localization is. It's really a failure to equilibrate in spite of interactions. And, the, and because of that, the opposite of many body localization so MBL is the sort of standard abbreviation of this. Um, the opposite of many body localization is thermalization, which is this closed many body system being a bath for itself and bringing all its subsystems to thermal equilibrium with each other under the unitary, dyna unitary quantum dynamics given by its Hamiltonian. Okay, and this is, if one you know, does this properly and takes limits properly, um, this is a phase transition. It's a sharp distinction, which is a phase transition. And like all phase transitions, to make it well-defined and sharp, um, the distinction, you have to take the limit of an infinite system and infinite time. Um, and that's, uh, but then in uh, you know, real uh, numerics on such systems or real experiments studying such systems, we don't have either of those two infinities. Um, and so we also want to understand uh, how this physics uh, manifests in finite systems and in finite time in either computational or experimental studies of, of these phenomena. Now, uh, maybe just quickly say why this is a lot harder than uh, the single particle Anderson localization problem, which is uh, the existence of single particle Anderson localization is rigorously proven mathematically. Um, if we look in Spencer 1983, whereas many body localization uh, is, is still uh, you know, non-rigorous, you know, the level of understanding is, is 
a lot lower and is not uh, mathematically rigorous. Um, and the essential reason for that difference is, so, so, uh, so I've drawn this picture here of a one-dimensional system of length L with localized states at either end. So those peaks represent uh, wave functions that are exponentially decaying that are localized, one at the left end and one at the right end, and their distance L apart. Now, if this was in D dimensions, they would be in a volume L to the D, um, and we would have L to the D such localized states in that volume, and they'd be spread over some energy range, which is just of order one, given by the bandwidth of whatever these particles are. Um, and so the level spacing, you know, if I take a typical localized state and ask what's another localized state that's almost degenerate with it, you will find one within an energy difference, one over L to the D. So I draw there two energy levels with some arrows, and the gap between them is one over L to the D. So those are the, you know, the closest in energy, closest in energy pair of states in this situation. But because the wave functions decay exponentially, the matrix element for hopping from one state to the other is exponentially small in the distance. And I show that as e to the minus l over zeta. You know, zeta is a decay length. Um, and so when your system is large, you have this exponentially small coupling between states while the states are in energy only power law small spaced. So the gaps are only power law small, but the couplings are exponentially small. And it's that exponential being so much stronger a function than the power law that makes it so this can be done rigorously. In the many body problem, instead of having in a, you know, in a system of length L with L spins, instead of having L states, we've got two to the L states. Say if we have a spin half chain with L spins, so we have now two to the L states. And, and, and if, we, if those states are localized and we ask you know, for a given localized state, what's another one that's almost degenerate with it? You're gonna find one within an energy difference, two to the minus L. So now the energy differences are exponentially small, just like the couplings between the states are exponentially small. And so these two uh, functions are similar, they're not the big difference between an exponential and a power law. It's just an exponential versus an exponential. And that's why, why the difference, and it makes uh, much harder to control this calculation. It's basically because the many body problem having exponentially many states, and we're looking in the middle of the spectrum, is extremely gapless, right? You know, it's, it's gaps. The gaps between states are exponentially small. Um, and that just makes it very hard to theoretically and mathematically control things. Okay. Okay, so now I wanna start in a trivial limit, a truly trivial limit of many body localization, which is uh, N non-interacting spin a halves, or you know, for this audience, qubits, um, each in a field. And you know whatever direction the field is, let's call it the z direction. Um, and so the Hamiltonian is this h naught I wrote there, which is just the sum of n spins in a field. Each one is in a field, and those fields are all different. Um, and we want the fields to be random and drawn from a continuous distribution, so that this Hamiltonian has no degeneracy. So a finite system will have no you know, the probability of a degeneracy is zero. And so we have no degeneracies. The fields are all different. Um, and that's a truly trivial situation. You know how to diagonalize that. You know what the eigenstates are like. Um, and, and one thing I want to emphasize here is the, the structure of this system in that it has n localized conserved operators. And that's, that's what many body localization is to the extent we understand it is the system has a complete set of localized conserved operators that commute with the Hamiltonian and commute with each other. And in this trivial example, they are just the Z components of each spin, right? 
And this system, you know, there's no bath here. You know, each spin is just happily sits there and Larmor processes about its own field. It doesn't go to thermal equilibrium with the other spins. It doesn't even know anything about them. Um, so this is trivially localized. Um, and now what, and then what we're going to do is add some interactions. So we add some interactions between the spins and the, the, you know, the question is, you know, do we keep this structure of N localized conserved operators like we have in this trivial limit? And if that's true, even with the interactions, then you're in the many body localized phase, you know, in a non-trivial part of the many body localized phase, or the alternative is uh, the interactions are enough to cause the system to thermalize, destroy these localized conserved operators, and the system goes to thermal equilibrium. Um, and then one can ask, you know, in a finite system and finite time, what intermediate things happen between these two possibilities? And, you know, perhaps there's even an intermediate phase, although there's really no concrete proposal for that. So, so uh, I won't talk about that as a possibility. And uh, David, questions, Larko? Yeah, maybe a quick clarification here, and we don't have to get too technical yet, but maybe that is, we'll get to it. Um, <laughs> if you tell us a little bit more about localize and, and sort of how to understand what that means here, as you mentioned, you know, we're working in limits often, and, you know, there's different, there's exponential localization, power law, et cetera, and maybe you can tell us. If localized bit. means, means uh, exponentially localized. So, so the operator would have support in either in real space or on a graph um, with the weight falling off exponentially as you move away from the localization center. Um, of course, the, the trivial example here is really localized, you know, localized to one site. Each operator is localized to one site. Uh, but more generally, when we have the MBL phase, the localized operators are, are operators that are concentrated near one site, but you know there'll be one spin operators, two spin operators, three. It'll be a sum of one spin, two spin, three spin operators, but with that series converging exponentially as you go to larger order operators, operators involving more than one spin, and also to larger distances. Great, and Does and if I. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. And, you know, because we have written sort of the n being uh, a finite number here, um, do I need to take any extra precaution or worries when we're talking in, in the finite case, finite n limit of, you know, sm smallish numbers of the order of 100 or more? Or, or is, is this kind of still the right message of exponential in this sense? Or is there any footnotes we should be concerned about? Well, I think there are a lot of footnotes we should be concerned about, but maybe not right this minute. Okay, we'll hold off on the footnotes. <laughs> I will perhaps mention some of those uh, as we go along, but none of them really. Yeah, I don't know, but but please, you know, when I'm when I'm uh, skipping over something that should be done a little more carefully, yeah, please interrupt again. Okay, um, great, great, thank you. Yeah, but you know, as I said before, these questions I ask, you know, do the do they remain what I mean? Do they re, does n localized conserved operators remain if we take the limit of large n, <laughs> or does the system thermalize? Does it thermalize if we take the limit of large n and large time? Um, so, so those questions only become sharp questions if you take the limits appropriately. Um, Okay, so as I said, you know, we take this model, we add some interactions. You could add a lot of different kinds of interactions, but there is a particular model, which I'll focus on today just for concreteness, uh, because it is the most studied uh, model for many body localization. And I call, I, we tend to call it the standard model, but it's only standard, meaning a lot of people work on it, not that it's any, any better than any other model. Um, in fact, in some sense, it's, it's worse, but um, it is, it's, it's fine for today's purposes. Uh, so this is a spin a half chain or a qubit chain. Um, and then we just have this field. Each spin is in a random field. The, 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 the standard thing people do is draw those fields as uh, random fields between minus W and W, um, uniform, you know, just a uniform probability distribution in that interval. Um, 
so so here I've got I, I call it I, now I call the number spins L because we're thinking of a chain of length L the L means length um, and then we just put Heisenberg interactions between the spins so a, a s dot s Heisenberg interaction between the spins with coupling J and that part traditionally is not made random the fields are random the interactions are all just the same um, so this is this is the model I'm going to talk about. Now, a lot of other models that uh, might have MBL or that have MBL effects or, or do have MBL, depending on the circumstance, um, have been studied. Um, so so variations on this that are known to have qualitative to be qualitatively different than this one dimensional model with short range interactions are if we go to more than one dimension, that's an important difference. Um, if we add longer range interactions, that's a very important difference. And if we give it uh, more symmetry, in particular, if we give it some non-abelian symmetry, that's an important difference. Um, now, we could also, instead of having random fields, we could have the fields in a non-random pattern, like quasi-periodic, um, and that we believe has real qualitative effects. It certainly has quantitative effects, and uh, but that's exactly the situation with the quasi-periodic cases versus the random case is still not not fully understood. Um, and then other variations on this that that that, that are, are often used is instead of having a Hamiltonian dynamics, have a Floquet dynamics where uh, the dynamics is a discrete time dynamics given by a unitary operator. Um, uh, we could. Uh, Remove, right, this model here has total SZ conserved, um, and that's not important for MBL. It's just a property of this particular standard model. So you could remove that conservation law. Um, and so, the, so these are all variations uh, on this that are explored, but I'm, I'm really just going to stick with this one model today. Um, OK, so there's the model again. Um, the Hamiltonian at the top, um, and and we're talking about one dimension. And in one dimension, uh, when we study MBL, so we when we take the large system limit, we take the standard thermodynamic limit. Um, that's not true for other models of MBL. So here we just you know keep J fixed and the fields drawn from this distribution and take the limit of a large system. Um, OK, and as I said before, we look at all states equally likely. So and, and this Hamiltonian is traceless so that uh, the average energy is zero. Um, and so if we go to infinite temperature or just take a typical state, the energy density will be zero. Uh, so let's just work there. So we could say we're working at average energy zero or at infinite temperature. So that's not a parameter. Um, and we've got. And then we're looking at long times, so the time's not a parameter. And so there's really just one parameter in this model, which is the ratio of these two terms, right? You know, these two terms don't commute. The random field doesn't compute, doesn't commute with the Heisenberg interaction, and they have strengths. You know, the random field has strength W, the Heisenberg interaction has strength J. And so the one parameter in this phase diagram is J over W or W over J. I'm gonna show J over W. Um, so my trivial limit can actually be there and not be at infinity, um, which is j equals zero. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to, so, so there's these two papers I mentioned here from Physical Review B 2022, uh, one by uh, me and my collaborators and one by Dries Sells. And I'm going to summarize uh, some of the stuff that was learned uh, in, the, in those works, uh, which in some sense revised the uh, picture of what this phase diagram looks like. Um, okay, so so we got this phase diagram. So my trivial limit is at zero on the far left. And then we turn on the interactions uh, and there's the many body localized phase when the interactions are weak enough. There's a phase transition to a regime which I'll tell you about, I'm gonna call the pre-thermal MBL regime. So it's it does thermalize, but on on uh, the scales we can access numerically, it looks very much localized. Um, and that's, uh, and then we have from a calculation I'm gonna tell you about, we have a bound on where that phase transition is, which I've written there. 
So the bound is less than or of order 0 0.06, so rather weak interactions. Um, so that's so that's one feature in this phase diagram. And then the other feature is where on you know on the kinds of size chains that we can actually diagonalize on the computer and ask, are the eigenstates thermal or are they localized? You know, is the are the matrix are the uh, energy levels obeying random matrix level statistics or not, you know, those kinds of questions. Um, there's a crossover, you know, on let's say chains of length 20 spins between a regime that really does thermalize nicely uh, at large J over W, which I'm calling the thermal regime, and then a regime, uh, this pre-thermal MVL regime, where on those length scales, the system looks localized, although we believe it will eventually thermalize if we could do bigger systems and longer times. Um, and then the transition between these two regimes is not a phase transition, it's a crossover. It's really a glass transition where some relaxation time has become longer than you can uh, see in the size system we're looking at. It exceeds the Heisenberg time um, of, of the many body system. And that occurs around uh, this parameter 0.3. So there's this intermediate regime, which is quite big. And, and the fact that this intermediate pre-thermal MBL regime is so big, that was the discovery of these papers. Because before that, that wasn't known. Um, so the first thing I want to tell you is, so what was new, what's new here is not the location of this crossover that's been known for a long time. Um, but people thought the crossover, people thought the phase transition was very near the crossover. Um, and these papers realize the phase transition, no, it's at much weaker interactions. Um, and so that's what I want to tell you about first, since that's sort of the this, this strong new result here. And, and, and so the, the question for the discussion next is what produced this, quote, bound? You know, when I say bound, I don't mean mathematically rigorous bound. I mean a numerical, a, a bound obtained from a numerical you know, calculation. Um, on the phase transition. Okay, now, if we start in the trivial MBL phase with no interactions at J equals zero, and then we turn on the interactions, um, we can ask, you know, what is the first instability of the many body localized phase that we will run into due to those interactions? Um, and uh, we believe you know, the, the, the first one that happens that is known, right? Of course, this is not rigorous. There might be some other instability that happens first is the one that's called the avalanche, which is discussed in this paper. I mentioned Daruk and Huvenir's again, Physical Review B uh, 2017 now. Um, so, but let me just say a little bit about, uh, so, so many body localization is the failure to, go to thermal equilibrium, really the failure to decohere, right? When you go to thermal equilibrium, you've just decohered, right? Whereas many body localization, it's a coherent phenomenon in the system, even though things are interacting, it still doesn't decohere completely, right? And it remembers, it stays in a state near its initial state and remembers information about the initial state locally. Um, and, and you know, this audience knows that when you have a battle between coherence and decoherence, the decoherence really has the upper hand, right? And that's why this transition is at such a small coupling constant. It's because the thermalization uh, is decoherence and that's powerful and will generally win. And to have the MBL phase survive at all is, is a surprising thing given that it, you know, the system should have been a bath and brought itself to equilibrium. Why didn't it? Um, okay. So that's just a little bit of context. Uh, but now I'm going to tell you about uh, this so-called avalanche. You know, it's, it's just a word, and I think you'll see maybe why it was called avalanche. Okay. So now we're going to... Okay, so we're considering now... This is now a theoretical argument. Um, and we have an infinite one-dimensional chain, and I've drawn a horizontal line across the middle of my slide. Apologies for no pointer. We tried to remedy this beforehand, but uh, I'm a very primitive uh, digital citizen. Um, 
So, so that horizontal line I've drawn through the middle of this slide represents my spin chain. And, and there's so many spins in it, you can't, I, I show two of them, but there's, you know, it's on a big length scale. Okay. And then in the middle, I've drawn these two little parentheses. And in that interval is what we call the rare region. And this is where the avalanche gets started. Um, and what that represents is a little patch of L spins in a row. Now, remember, we have these random fields on the spins and, and they're just random, right? And so there's always a possibility that a whole bunch of spins in a row all have the same field on them to some precision comparable to the interaction J. So the local rare region is a place where just by chance, the variations in these random fields are smaller or of order the interaction J. And so that region isn't random. It's, it's actually quite regular. And that system will thermalize locally in that rare region. So locally in the rare region, the, the, you know, if I start it off in any state, it will get very entangled and it makes a, a, a local finite thermal bath, right? Although it's not a complete thermal bath because it's a finite system and it actually has a discrete level spacing. Um, and as long as the interactions are non-zero and I have an infinite chain or, uh, and, and the length of my rear region is a finite number of L, little L spins, this will happen at some density in that chain, right? Because you know, it's just statistics, right? With random numbers, any possibility will happen if you have a big enough sample. Um, so these rare regions are present, okay? And then in this rare region, it's made a bath and it's thermalized locally, those L spins. And then that bath tries to thermalize the nearby spins. Okay, so everywhere else to the right and to the left of this rare region, we're assuming the random fields are just typical values and it's many body localized there. Um, but this little bath is trying to thermalize it. Okay. Now, if we consider a spin at distance R spins, say to the right of the bath or the left of the bath, but say to the right of the bath, uh, that spin in the many body localized regime, it's, you know, there will be a localized operator which commutes with the Hamiltonian there to a very high precision and has an exponential tail going off in both directions like we were discussing earlier with Slotko. And that exponential tail will go towards the bath. And because the tail uh, goes to the bath, there will be an exponentially small coupling between this spin and the bath, which falls off exponentially with the distance from the bath, right? And I've called that, instead of saying it's exponential in R, I say it falls off by a factor of K per spin as I go along the chain. So this gamma of R is how fast this spin will relax due to coupling to this bath, if the bath is big enough to, to relax it. Right. The bath has to be big enough to relax it. But if it is, it will relax at this rate due to that coupling. And that, that, that relaxation rate is falling off by a factor of K as we go along because you know, the, 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 the localized region here on the right, it, everything, all the interactions are falling off exponentially with distance because it's localized. Okay. Okay, so, so if we consider this system, say we start it in a product state with no entanglement and then we let it go, very quickly the rear region will get entangled and then that it'll make a bath and it'll start thermalizing and entangling with the spins nearby. And after time k to the plus r, it has, if the initial uh, rear region is big enough to thermalize out to distance r, it will be able to relax the spins out to distance r to the right and to the left and so now, after this time, k to the r, the avalanche involves L plus 2r spins. And so the finite bath, it has L to the 2 plus, L plus 2r spins in it. So it's got two to that number states. And so the many body level spacing is two to the minus L plus 2r, right? So if I just take this putative bath and ask, you know, many bodies, you know, what's the level spacing of this putative bath? Um, and it's just, you know, one over the size of its Hilbert space. Um, 
So it's exponentially small in the size of the bath. Okay. And then we want to ask, is that uh, bath able to thermalize the next spin? Right. So here we are again. So at the top, there's the rear region. It thermalized things out to distance R. And then there's the next spin. And, and we want to ask, you know, what's the story here? So this finite bath can relax this next spin if the many body level spacing of the bath, delta of R, which is 2 to the minus L plus 2R, is less than the line width of that spin if it does relax, right? And so if the spin relaxes at a rate k to the minus r, and the bath has a level spacing that's much finer than that, then as far as this spin is concerned, that bath has is a continuum, and it can just relax to it, right? And that spin will get entangled with the bath, and the system will thermalize out to that, out to that distance. Um, so the bath appears as a continuum if this inequality is true at the top. Uh, now, you can see why I wrote, so, so the, the delta of R is decaying with R as 2 to the minus 2R, which is 4 to the minus R. So K equals 4 is a special case, right? So if K is less than 4, okay, so first of all, at R equals 0, the bath has a head start. Its level spacing is very small compared to the line width of the spin. And so the bath is good at, at small r, just because you know, it got a head start because it has L spins. And then if k is less than 4, it just gets better. The bath level spacing goes down faster than the line width of the spin goes down. So the spin always sees the bath as a continuum, and it always relaxes to it, gets entangled with it. The avalanche never stops, right? And it sweeps through the whole system and thermalizes the whole system because there's another, you know, you, you have these rare regions at some density, right? And so avalanches are coming out of all of them and eventually they just overrun the whole system. The system thermalizes, the MBL phase is unstable. So in order for the MBL phase to be stable, this parameter K I've given has to be bigger than four. If it's bigger than four, then eventually the relaxation rate of the spin gets slower than the level spacing of the bath, and the spin doesn't see the bath as a bath. It just sees it as a discrete spectrum, and it doesn't match to it, and it doesn't get entangled with it because it's detuned. Um, so, so k equals 4 is the boundary between uh, where the MBL phase is stable and where it isn't stable. Um, now, let me just say something quickly, if I did this in more than one dimension, the, uh, the level spacing of the bath would go down faster because the avalanche is going in all directions and the number of spins involved is growing as r to the d in d dimensions, whereas the coupling would still be just k to the minus r, right? And so what happens in more than one dimension is the avalanche doesn't stop. Its MBL phase is unstable always in the standard thermodynamic limit. It's only in one dimension that it could possibly be stable um, with short range interactions. Um, okay, so, so to summarize, K less than four means the MBL phase is unstable. K greater than four means it could be stable. Um, there could be some other instability, but it could be stable. So k greater than 4 means possibly the MBL phase is stable. Um, and we'll assume it, it is stable because there's no concrete proposal for another instability to happen first. Um, OK, so remember, this, this th what we're asking is, what's the relaxation rate of a spin at a distance r from a bath, and how does it k with the distance? Right, That's what we're asking. Um, OK. And now to numerically estimate this. So this isn't about does the avalanche get started. We're just asking how does its coupling decay with distance? You know, really does it stop, right? And so what we realized is we don't really have to realistically model the avalanche getting started. We can just start it in a very simple way. Um, 
And, and, and so what we do is the following. Slavko, do you want to interrupt and ask another question? Um, yeah, maybe two questions. I think there's one from the audience and, and another one. If you go back to the last uh, slide real quick, it, you know, the, the argument here really rests on, on this uh, inequality, right? Um, yeah. We kind of take that as the, as the main rule. So maybe it's worth pausing and just asking, you know, is this like an ironclad argument or are there any sort of phenomena or other things that we should worry about or concern ourselves with that could that could break this uh, at at this stage or um, well, certainly maybe... not ironclad. <laughs> yeah, as I said, uh, you know, none of this stuff is rigorous. Now, now, you know, this is a a general thing about you know when you have a putative bath which is a finite system and has a non-zero level spacing. And then you ask, do you thermalize with it? So this is something, so, so I actually have a paper recently with uh, Alex Otlin and Tobias Miklitz and Alan Morningstar, who's also on this work with me, my, my former student, uh, where we just did a very simple model, which is a random matrix N by N. So therefore having level spacing one over N, and then we weakly couple it to another level. And then we, we uh, ask, you know, when do you see Fermi's golden rule decay? When can that level decay into the bath a la Fermi's golden rule? And when doesn't it? Um, and, and uh, you know, with, you know, Otland and Miklitz's supersymmetric uh, techniques, they could actually just fully calculate that, you know, closed form expression. And then Alan, my student, was able to, you know, numerically show, yes, of course, you know, you do the numerics, it's exactly the same. Of course, it had to be. Um, and, and, and it is just this story, right? So this story, you can test it uh, under some circumstances. And it's, you know, so there is a circumstance where you take a discrete math like this and couple it weakly to a system and then ask, does it thermalize or not? And you do see indeed it crosses over at exactly this criteria. So, you know, I don't know, uh, but that's just circumstantial, right? Of course, this is a much more complicated situation than the one we were able to analyze there. Um, All right. Right. Thank you, David. There's another question about decoherence three subspace. But I'm going to save that to the end to to maybe keep you from Ayana. So thank you, Ayana, for the question. It's a very good question, but I th maybe we'll get it at the end of the talk uh, by David here. Okay. Um, yeah. So so the calculation we did is the following. So in the middle, I've got a chain of L, L spins. So that's just like a typical sample of my MBL system, and it's in the parameter range where it's possibly many body localized. Um, and then what we do is we just weakly couple an infinite Markovian bath to spin one, to the first spin. So we've got this infinite bath coupled weakly to spin one. And that infinite bath, it's what it's modeling is very far to the left somewhere is a rare region which started an avalanche, which grew very big and got to spin zero. And now we're asking, can it get to spin L, right? Can it sweep through this region, right? And so it's very weakly coupled because it's very far away and things are you know, very close to localized um, and it's very big, right? And so, so we just replace it with a Limbladian and Markovian infinite bath. Um, so it's so, so it's an open system calculation here. We have a system with a Hamiltonian and a very weak coupling, and we take the limit of weak coupling, um, which is about Dries Sells pointed out that it's perfectly valid to do that. And so we do that. Um, and 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 it, the infinite bath is an infinite temperature with no conservation laws. And so the system will will thermalize to infinite temperature, which is the identity density matrix for the system. So we know the eigenstate, the leading eigenstate of the Limbladi, and it's just the trivial maximally mixed state. Um, but then we look at the gap, the, the, the slowest mode other than the steady state. Um, and in this circumstance here, that mode is in almost all samples, a localized operator near the farthest spin from the bath. So the farthest spin from the bath is most weakly coupled to the bath. And so there will be a, you know, an almost conserved operator, which is localized near that spin. And that's the slowest mode of the system, right? And so we're getting the relaxation and that 
gets thermalized with the bath at a rate given by the gap of this Lindbladian. Um, and so we're getting the relaxation rate of the spin at distance L. And then we do this as a function of L. So the graph at the bottom is a schematic of what it ends up looking like. That, that right. So it's supposed to be decaying exponentially. Uh, so you make a semi-log plot, uh, but it always curves the way I show, right? So, so the, 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 you know, the, it's not simply k to the minus r. It's a, it's a, a bit of a stretched exponential. It always curves that way. Um, and, and, but we, and since it always curves that way, the slope at the very end, when we have to stop the numerics, and we didn't stop it because the Hilbert space got too big, we stopped it because the gap of the Lombardi and disappeared into the double precision arithmetic on the computer. Um, and, uh, that's why it's only at 13 spins rather than something like 20, um, and so that final slope we view as an upper bound on the slope of this thing, the asymptotic slope at large L, um, and that gives an upper bound on, on where the uh, phase transition is. So the slope is minus log K, and since the slope is this or less, we have an, an uh, upper bound on K. And, and so now we go to the phase diagram here at the top. Um, so we've estimated this K. We've actually just produced a bound on K. But if that bound is four or is below four, then we know K is less than four and we know the MBL phase is unstable. Okay, so we have this regime above the coupling J over W being 0 0.06 or so where we've produced a bound, which is a good argument that this system is unstable to an avalanche. It, it is not in the MBL phase. In spite of looking MBL on, the, if we do the closed system calculation for, for uh, you know, any sizes we can do, right? The eigenstates have area law. They, they don't, you know, the relaxation time is, is much longer than the Heisenberg time. So the system looks localized in the finite size system. Um, and so that's this intermediate pre-thermal MBL regime, which there's a good theoretical and partially numerical argument that it does thermalize in the limit of an infinite system, but on the size systems one can study either numerically or in experiment, it looks localized for almost all purposes. Um, that's this intermediate regime. The intermediate regime, numerically accessible closed systems act MBL, but now we believe larger systems do thermalize. And the surprise here was that this bound, you know, I was expecting this bound to be, you know, maybe a factor of two below this crossover, but really it ended up a factor of five below. That was that was a surprise. Um, I didn't, you know, but that's that's what came out of the numerics, and uh, you know, two different groups did the same numerics, getting the same same result. So I think it's I think it's uh, it's really it's, it's, it's something to trust. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, I, I mentioned this one paper, uh, by, uh, Kiefer Amenudis et al from 2020, where that was the thing which got us looking in this regime more carefully because they were seeing some dynamics in this regime that seemed localized, but it seemed more dynamics than you'd expect. And so that sort of got us going, looking much more carefully. Um, so now I wanna uh, go uh, briefly to another topic. So the question is in this intermediate regime, which is uh, where the system uh, on the time scales and size scales that are readily accessible in numerics and experiment, it looks localized, but we have these pretty strong arguments that it will ultimately thermalize. You know, what can we study in that regime in closed systems? Um, and, and the thing we, we've been looking at uh, and other people have been looking at are what's called many body resonances. Uh, and so that's the next thing I want to tell you about is many body resonances. So now we're, I think we're in this uh, intermediate regime, maybe kind of close to the crossover, you know, well, well past this phase transition. Um, 
Okay. Okay, so what are many body resonances? Um, so, so it's something uh, Sarengo Plokrishnan and I and a bunch of collaborators actually wrote about in this old paper in 2015, but unfortunately we didn't follow up on it at that time. Um, but then uh, Phil Crowley and Anusha Chandran uh, really followed up on it, uh, as well as uh, Sam Garrett and Roy and John Chalker um, recently. And then we, we, we have a bunch of work, work on it, okay? So, so now, now we're talking about the closed system uh, and not the issue of the avalanche. Um, and, and so we have a Hamiltonian H and we find two eigenstates, which I call alpha and beta, so two localized. So we're in a, we're in a localized regime and the system is small enough so that it looks localized, even though it might thermalize at a much larger size system. Um, and so we diagonalize the Hamiltonian and find two eigenstates, alpha and beta, that are, uh, that are nearby in energy, uh, you know, adjacent in energy. Um, and typically those will differ over many spins. You know, they'll differ over roughly half the spins in the system if you just take two adjacent eigenstates because they're just almost degenerate just by chance. You know, the random fields happen to add up that way because um, we're in the localized regime. Okay, now we're going to ask the question, are alpha and beta a many-body resonance? And they are a many-body resonance if there are two more localized states, A and B, and alpha and beta are linear combinations of A and B. They're Schrodinger cat-like states, okay? Um, so, so, so here, so let's go down to the bottom. So, so now we're, we're, we've got, just got two eigenstates and we're just considering that two-dimensional Hilbert space spanned by those two eigenstates. So that's a block sphere. So I've drawn a sloppy picture of a block sphere there at the bottom. So that's the block sphere spanned by these two eigenstates we're talking about. And the two eigenstates, the spin polarization in alpha versus beta differs let's say strongly at roughly half the spins, right? Because that's typically what happens with two localized eigenstates. They're just localized in completely different states. Um, but the spins are typically localized either up or down, right? So there's a 50% chance that they're both localized in the same direction. Um, okay, so now we've got this block sphere and then we consider the whole block sphere, and we could pick a different basis. Instead of alpha beta, which diagonalizes the Hamiltonian, we could pick A and B, which is a different basis on that block sphere. And we find the A and B that are orthonormal that are most localized, meaning the spins have the largest polarizations, right? And so that's that sum. So we maximize the sum of the, of the squares of the polarizations of the spins in the, in state A and state B, right? And, and that's something, you know, it's just a quadratic form and for any pair of eigenstates alpha beta for a Hamiltonian, we can diagonalize, we can do this calculation and ask, you know, and usually if you're in a localized regime, A and B are very close to alpha and beta. And so therefore alpha and beta are not shredding or cat-like states made out of two very different localized states. But occasionally it happens. Right, and that's what a many-body resonance is. is it's two, it's uh, localized eigenstates that are in some sense bi-localized between two different configurations that differ by flipping a lot of spins. Okay, and this is a you know a systematic procedure for just going in and finding them. You know, given a Hamiltonian, you can just go in and find them, and and look at their properties. Okay. Let's see. How strict are you on the end time, Slotko? <laughs> yeah. There I am. Um, well, we have <laughs> soft stop, so you, we can run a, a few minutes uh, over. So that's. Yeah, I, right. I, I always stop exactly when I should, but I, <laughs> you know, I will stop when you tell me to. But I, I have three more pages. <laughs> Okay, we're but, almost uh, there. I'm, I'm well, happy to see have a pointer today, so you know we, we have to go a little slower, so that's perfectly fine. And we've had questions, so yeah, that's okay. Um, a few minutes okay, over. so let, let me go on. Okay, so we've so we've we have this eigenstate alpha and beta, 
right? And we found the basis that's most localized, which might be rather different than alpha and beta. And then we go to that basis of the most localized eigenstates and look what the Hamiltonian look like, looks like, right? And it's just a two by two matrix because we're just working in this two by two, we're working in this two dimensional state space, which contains two eigenstates. And so the Hamiltonian in that space is nothing more than a two by two matrix. And we just write it out this way in terms of its matrix elements. And so those we can just get, right? So this is something we can just do on the computer for a given, a given sample of a particular small system in an MBL regime, right? And when we do this, you know, we can do this, you know, enormous numbers of states and samples and get good statistics. And, and you find that the uh, diagonal elements uh, are basically Poisson distributed, really showing no level repulsion, just as expected. So there's no surprise there. Uh, but when you look, and, and, and they're typically, uh, when we have L spins, the typical difference between these, because we picked adjacent energies is two to the minus L. Um, because we pick states at adjacent energies. Um, but then the off diagonal matrix element we find is very broadly distributed within each sample, right? So it's not like some samples are more disordered than others. It's like every sample has an extremely broad distribution of, of these off diagonal matrix elements over the pairs of states within that sample. Um, um, so in this sense, we're not talking about rare samples. We're just talking about typical states. We're talking about states in typical samples. Um, we're interested in atypical states in typical samples, as we'll see. Uh, but, but, but anyway, so, so this, this off-diagonal matrix element is very broadly distributed. And if we look at its logarithm, uh, it's distributed by six or more orders of magnitude on the size systems we can study. You know, we're talking about you know, 15 spins type scale. Um, and, and in most pairs, if we're in the localized regime, the, the matrix element is much smaller than the level spacing. And, and, and so we don't really have a resonance. We call it an end-to-end -end near resonance. So I forgot to mention, uh, we focus on we do, we do chains of length L with open ends, and, and we focus on pairs of eigenstates that are adjacent in energy and differ on the first spin and on the last spin and typically on half the spins in between. So they're end-to-end -end resonances in a finite sample, right? So we're talking about end-to-end -end resonances. Um, so where the process of coupling A to B involves all spins in the whole sample. Um, and so if, if the matrix element is small compared to the level spacing, we call that an end-to-end -end near resonance because it's a near resonance because the energies are almost the same, but the matrix element was too small to actually turn it into a resonance. And then the cases where uh, the off-diagonal matrix elements is comparable, that's a real end-to-end -end resonance and the eigenstates are Schrodinger cat-like. Um, and could we just clarify, David, the, the picture that you drew for us uh with hands for what end to end means. So you're saying, you know, one state might have a spin that's up over here very, very strongly on one end, and maybe it's down on the other, and the other one has to basically be the flip side. Is that, and then the so, middle? So, okay, work. so we have two eigenstates, yeah. and to first approximation, we're in the localized regime. So the expectation values of the spins in the eigenstates are mostly near plus one or near minus one, right? Got it. They're, they're localized along the Z direction. Yes. Right? And then, and so then we look at alpha and we look at beta and, and I want, when I look at the first spin, one of them is polarized up in alpha say and down in beta or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So the first spin, if I go from eigenstate alpha to eigenstate beta, the first spin flips. Mm -hmm. So eigenstate alpha and beta differ in the orientation of the first spin. And similarly, they differ in the orientation of the last spin. And typically half the spins in between, right? So, so they differ over the whole sample. That's the point, right? Because you're going to have resonances that are much stronger uh, that might just differ on three spins in the middle of the sample, right? And then the matrix element just involves flipping three spins mm -hmm. and the off-diagonal matrix element will be much bigger, right? And those are short-range resonances, right? But here we're focused on long-range resonances, you know, many-body resonances that involve the whole sample, right? That's what we're focused on right now.
Got it. And maybe you feel free to punt this question to later, but since we brought up earlier the conserved local quantities, the Leoms, and now the, the many body states, maybe it'll be nice to draw the connection there at some point. I don't know if now's the right time. Yeah, well, okay. The, the Leoms, so these resonances are present and give a lot of detailed structure that the Leoms have to contain. Right, so our naive, I don't know if you followed the literature, our naive idea of the localized operators is they're a sum of terms, you know, two spin terms, three spin terms, et cetera, falling mm -hmm. off exponentially with the distance. And those terms are essentially random, mm -hmm. right? But that's not true. So those terms have an enormous amount of detailed correlations, which is encoding these resonances. Uh -huh. So these resonances are encoded in a very non-trivial way in detailed correlations of the localized conserved operators. Mm -hmm. right? And that's the physics we basically missed until recently in, uh, in the discussion. It's I see. a very important question. Um, well, that's fantastic, yeah, 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 good. I have lots of follow-ups, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> right, so so remember the, the uh, the level spacing in this little two by two block is two to the minus L. And then the off diagonal matrix element, we wanna ask, oh, is that typically bigger or smaller than two to the minus L? So I'm gonna, so, so here's now my probability distribution of this off diagonal matrix element. And remember it's very broad. So that's a log scale and that might be, you know, five, six orders of magnitude wide, but the typical is the median, it's in the middle and, and you care whether that Q is greater than or less than two, right? When Q is greater than two, as we go to larger systems, the matrix elements HAB go down faster than the typical energy differences and the resonances become rarer, right? Whereas if Q is less than two, the resonances will become more common as L increases. Um, so that's a point, and this was this was known already by Crowley and Chandran. Um, I'm just, just restating what they said. Um, but then there's also the tail of this distribution to the strongest near resonances, which is uh, which you know is much stronger HAB, um, and that's the the new thing we found that there is this tail to very strong HAB. Uh, and, and, and just talking about the typical value, you're really missing out on the important part of the physics. Um, and actually, let me just say, say what's there. So we have a recent PRL just from this year, which I mentioned there, where we show that these strongest near resonances, uh, they actually are the dominant thing causing the avalanche to spread. And so we understand how the avalanche works in terms of these near resonances. And that's in this, this recent PRL. And, and in the avalanche instability happening at such weak coupling is basically happening because the tail of this distribution goes way out to strong coupling. And these resonances, you know, these resonances are much stronger than you would naively estimate uh, because, and, 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 and the rare ones, the, the strongest one in a typical sample plays a dominant role in spreading the avalanche, even though it's only one pair of eigenstates or, you know, typically. Um, okay, so we can sort of add to this phase diagram another feature, uh, which is, you know, the pre-thermal MBL regime is mostly Q bigger than two, which meaning the resonances are going away as we go to bigger systems on the size scales we can study, although eventually they're gonna come back and become avalanches. And exactly how that works is still an open question, right? And so that's just, you know, you know we, we know that must happen, but exactly how that works, we really don't, really don't have it insight to. And then right near the crossover, you can actually find a regime where Q is less than two. And this is again, Crowley and Chandran saw this. Um, and there the, res the, the resonances are becoming more common as we go to larger system size and the crossover is drifting to smaller J um, so that regime is understood, um, that, that sort of near crossover regime with Q less than two. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, uh, that's, yeah, I've, I've already gone five minutes over, so let me just stop there and just 
sort of give a little bit of a summary. So here's my phase diagram. Um, so the, the new thing is this large intermediate regime that we call pre-thermal MBL. It looks MBL, but we believe it's going to eventually thermalize if we do a big enough system and a long enough time. Um, we have these uh, this upper bound estimate of where the phase transition is, um, but it's at an extremely small coupling. And because it's at an extremely small coupling, it corresponds to an extremely long time scale. And basically that phase transition at between the MBL phase and the pre-thermal MBL regime is really an academic point. It's never going to be seen in closed system numerics or in experiments you may be able to learn something about it indirectly like we did with our open system calculation but but that's you know that's although it's an interesting theoretical point i would say that's not the physics of mbl that's that's the math of mbl or the point of principle of mbl but not the physics the physics is this crossover where things are actually happening on time scales that are relevant to you know that are accessible um, and that's not the phase transition. So that's one of the points is we shouldn't, you know, that's, you know, for, for 10 or 15 years in the studies of MBL, people wanted to put that in, uh, say the phase transition is there. This is the finite size effect of a phase transition. But now I think we realize that's not, that's not the right story. It's more like a glass transition. It's something slows down enormously, but it doesn't really slow down all the way to infinite time. Um, and it's some sort of crossover you know, glass phenomenon. It's not a phase transition. And we believe that the many body resonances are probably a useful probe for exploring this physics, you know, particularly a little bit on the MBL side of this crossover, which is the, you know, the regime we'd like to understand better. Um, and so that's sort of on the agenda for future work. Um, but, you know, I think there's still a lot more to be learned there. Um, and I'll stop there and open it up for more questions. Thank you, David, for this uh, beautiful introduction and really exciting sort of new chapter in the whole story. It just it just keeps evolving. It's very awesome to see. Uh, folks, this is a great time to post your questions in the chat as we come up here to the last uh, couple of minutes. And I'll keep this very brief uh, since we are running a little over. Um, maybe I'll just start with the first question I mentioned to you from Ayana, uh, which came earlier about uh, this failure to decohere. Is this uh, in the MBL phase and maybe not even the phase, but the MBL regime, you know, to expand? Yeah, yeah well, absolutely. Right, right. So, so, of course, if something, you know, remains coherent, this is interesting for possible uh, quantum information applications. Um, and yeah, a lot of people are thinking about this, right? And then there's also the, you know, like, you know, the opposite story, which is, you know, if there is some instability towards thermalization, which is decoherence, you know, can we understand that? And, you know, how we might change the system to make it, you know, less likely to thermalize, right? And so, you know, I guess there's a there's a question which has been discussed by various people. Uh, you know, I know DiVincenzo and Otland and Trebs have been discussing this. I don't know how, uh, which is, you know, will quantum computers actually have to operate in a regime which is in some sense many body localized or will the error correction be able to take care of the decoherence, you know, without using anything like localization, um, you know. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I think how that's going to play out in the long run, right? If, you know, if you just have a, a computer, you know, with qubits, which are, have level spacings, which are similar to each other, and you don't do error correction, you know, it's, it's going to thermalize, right? <laughs> and, it, and it's going to leave the face, it's, it's going to leave the logical space you want it to be in, right? Right. Now, of course, you might be able to just keep it there through things, you know, that have nothing to do with, Anderson localization. But if you had Anderson localization helping you with that, just sort of passively, you know, that might help, right? And so, 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 so that's a question, you know, is, is that a, something one wants in a design principle or is it not really very helpful because other things will take care of it? 
I'm sort of summarizing a discussion which you know I hear about. I, I haven't really yeah. fully engaged in it myself. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, David has this. Uh, De Vincenzo has this yeah, uh, paper also from a few years ago on superconducting circuits and and this transition. So folks can look that up. Uh, but by the way, the crossover is very interesting. I'm, I'm I'm personally sort of philosophically very much in favor of this overall discussion of saying, well, you know, okay, maybe the strict phase is all the way over there, and who cares about that because it's a bit academic. But then the crossover point is very interesting. It reminds me of the joke uh, about you know why do mountains flow in the sight of God? <laughs> Because, you you know, because even mountains are fluids uh, when viewed over a long enough time scale. So this is a joke from hydrodynamics and, uh, you know, ties into Deborah's number, which is all about, you know, this time scale of observation and of experiments. And I, th I think that's roughly what you're saying. Hopefully I'm not mis 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 paraphrasing you here uh, on, on the pre-thermal type of regime. And that, that's yeah. interesting on yeah, its there's own. Just some, yeah, there's some slow dynamics there, which, you know. So what does that mean? But, but the details of it, we don't understand. You know, we have this mm -hmm. avalanche, which we know happens. But my guess is if you're up near that crossover, it's not the avalanche that's going to give the interesting slow dynamics, which is going to be the next thing one probes as one looks at this deeper. It's probably some other physics. Um, but we don't know what it is, really. Um, so, so I think, you know, what is the net, you know, Beyond the time scale we've probed, what's the next important piece of physics that is going to come in near that crossover? You know, I think that's the important current physical question that you know is physics, um, and and I'd like to you know for the community to make some progress on that. But you know we we we, we have made minor attempts without success on. You know, beginning to address that question. Well, the chapters keep going. Um, so I have maybe one quick follow up to that, and then a question from Alice uh, Stanko here. So the first one is, um, you know, we in the first part of the talk, you basically said no MBL in two D because of this argument of the inequality. No, no MBL in two D in the standard thermodynamic limit. One has to be careful. Okay. <laughs> MBL is not a thermodynamic phase transition. So if you want to study the MBL transition, you don't have to take the thermodynamic limit. You have to take the limit of a large system that is appropriate for this particular system, right? So when people say there's no MBL in two dimensions, what they mean is in the standard thermodynamic limit, there's no MBL. But that's just because they're taking the large system limit incorrectly for the physics of MBL. There is another way of taking the limit, which brings out a phase transition. Which and this is in a paper of mine. With I see. I see. A, in two D, in and it's a in sharp phase transition. You have to take the interactions to zero as you take the system large. So you can have interactions which are thermodynamically negligible, but dynamically very important. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Now, so if you do that's... statistical mechanics of a dilute gas, you assume it equilibrates because all you need is a little bit of scattering to make it equilibrate. Um, but the scattering can be thermodynamically negligible. So the ideal gas law is great, but the system does equilibrate, right? And that's because the scattering is dynamically very important, but thermodynamically negligible, right? And, and that's true for dilute gases. Until you make them too dilute, right? If you take a dilute gas in a finite box with a finite number of particles, and you turn the interact the scattering between the particles down too small for that size system, it will actually localize in momentum space and not thermalize. So there's an MBL transition in the dilute gas, the textbook dilute gas, between where it actually goes to thermal equilibrium and it doesn't. But it doesn't happen in the thermodynamic limit. It happens in a different, you have to take the limit of a large system a different way. Hmm. So, so that's yeah. an interesting point. You know, you sort of set me off on something there. I yeah, think yeah, you noticed no, that. This, is, uh, this yeah, is something uh, yeah. I like to, you know, that's a different talk. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, because there was this whole discussion of, you know, two yeah, this, this subject is enormous. You know, <laughs> you, you, you know, I could get seven seminars on it. I think that's a very good point because in the community, I think when I talk to people, a lot of times the, the, the folks I've talked to tends to say, ah, I'm probably nothing in 2D, you know, in 1D, but but it's a very good point to emphasize this. 
And of course, I think now you raise the question as to what about this whole pre-thermal regime in 2D that could have these exponentially long equilibration times, um, which we yeah. could go down. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, in some sense, if you take the standard thermodynamic limit in 2D, the MBL phase disappears on that scale, but the pre-thermal regime, you know, that will be then dominant, right? You know, you'll still see MBL physics, right? You know, people have done experiments in 2D with MBL systems and MBL is there, right? Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a phase transition, but it's there. It's clear. Right? Yeah. That's, I, it's, it's all, it's all pre-thermal stuff. If right. you think of the standard thermodynamic limit, it's all pre-thermal because ultimately it's going to thermalize. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's not interesting. I couldn't agree more. I mean, we, we just put an experiment on this exactly in 120 something qubits. So question from Oles, who's on that paper, by the way, um, is the lead author of that paper. In your opinion, could we have a rigorous mathematical proof of the existence of the MBL phase without artificial assumptions just uh, from the form of the Hamiltonian? Well, this is a big challenge. Um, but, you know, there's a small number of mathematical physicists who don't think this is impossible. And so, uh, you know, people are trying, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a hard problem. It's um, a very hard problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, seeing as we, I have plenty of other questions, but seeing as we are here almost 20 minutes over, um, David, maybe this is, this is the time that I should let you, you know, Leave us with any final words or, or announcements or messages you'd like to share with us. And then uh, when we end, you know, don't just log off right away. We'll debrief and then go from there. Okay. No, I don't need to add anything. Thank you. <laughs> great. Well, David, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Folks, uh, you've been a great audience, as always, tuning in from all over the world. I didn't read it earlier, but we've got folks from Spain, California, Colorado, Oregon, Munich, Spain, Italy, Singapore, Chicago. New Haven, et cetera, et cetera. So the list goes on and on. So thank you everybody for making all the time zones today. This video will stay recorded so you can go back and rewatch it. But the only time to ask questions live is Friday at noon Eastern time every Friday. So we'll see you next Friday at noon Eastern. Click like and subscribe. Thank you, David. Thanks, folks. <laughs>